The image of the demonologist usually takes one of two different forms. The first is that of the learned necromancer, skilled in the dark arts, compiling their wisdom only just before demonic specters wrench them off to some infernal doom. The second is that of the inquisitor, also compiling an account of the workings of spectral evil, though here taken from the mass of confessions extracted through unspeakable torture. Though, aside from perfunctory decrees, do we rarely hear the voice of the aristocracy in this discussion upon witches, warlocks, necromancy, and the sundry doing of demons. The rather extraordinary exception to that rule is the 1597 Demonology by James VI of Scotland. This dialogue details in popular form the existence, nature, and proper treatment of witches and sorcerers and the various kinds of spirit in their diabolical service. In fact, the work was informed and prompted by James's own experience with the powers of Satan, as several years earlier he found himself to be the target of an alleged assassination plot by an international cabal of witches that needs to be a show. Let's explore this brief but fascinating work, the Danish and Scottish witch trials, and the general direction of insular and by extension colonial American attitudes toward witchcraft and its prosecution. This episode is also exciting because it's a collaboration with my friend and colleague over at Atanche Films. I'll be tackling the historical and theological angle, and you can find an annotated cinematic reading of the 1597 Demonology by James VI and I in original pronunciation over at his channel, so make sure to check out that companion to this episode. Also, if you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, make sure to subscribe and check out my other content on topics in esotericism, including curated playlists by topic. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube for free, I'd hope you consider supporting my work by taking a look at my Patreon with a one-time donation, or perhaps with the super thanks option you can find beneath the video. But now, to the demonology of James VI and I, and the witch trials that inspired and flowed from it. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Before getting started, it's worth making a distinction between the people, mostly women, persecuted for witchcraft in the late medieval and early modern period, the notion of the witch as it develops in the mind of the inquisitors and the witch hunters, and the contemporary people who identify as witches as part of their religious and spiritual vocations. For the purposes of this episode, I'm going to reserve the term witch for what scholars refer to as the elaborated theory of witchcraft. This is the mature notion of witchcraft as developed in the minds of inquisitors, jurists, theologians, and philosophers of the late medieval and early modern period that held that, and get this, a new woman-led heretical sorcery sect had appeared in Europe, marked by entering into a pact or covenant with the devil and thus apostasy from Christianity. This would include sexual relations with the devil and various demons, aerial flight for the purposes of attending a Sabbath, sometimes referred to as a synagogue because it's the Middle Ages when I throw some anti-Semitism in there, which is presided over by, well, Satan himself at which point initiates enter into said pact followed by incestuous and promiscuous sex, the general practice of maleficent magic, the slaughtering of fetuses and babies, and various means for preventing human procreation, especially making men's penises disappear, 
whose aim was to undermine Christendom as part of the devil's ongoing war with God. In fact, by the mid-15th century, the theory took on positively apocalyptic dimensions by arguing that the new witch heresy was part of the final attempt on the part of Satan to forestall his doom by sending human beings down a spiral of wickedness and sin and crime as a final outrage against God. Regardless, the elaborated theory of witchcraft, while it varied from region to region or writer to writer, had more or less coalesced by around 1500, and thus set the stage for the frenzied period of persecutions which would follow, resulting in the deaths of around 40 to 60,000 people, overwhelmingly women, in the period up to around 1750. So I'm going to be using the term witch to describe that giant crazy conspiracy theory. Thus, by 1590, when the trials which informed James to compose the demonology for publication in 1597 took place, the elaborated theory of witchcraft was already well established in Europe, and the trials were actually reaching their peak throughout Europe, specifically in the part of Central Europe and Germany. In fact, the first publications openly doubting this whole hideous business had already appeared and James's text is actually highly reactionary when compared to other witch hunting literature of the time. But to grasp the 1597 demonology, we have to turn back to 1589, 1590, and to the marriage of James to Anne of Denmark. That wedding was actually delayed when Anne set sail for Scotland in August of 1589. Strange contrary winds are said to have beset her ship alone, just her ship among the group of about 20 causing her to shelter in Oslo for the winter. James, not to be deterred, himself set sail for Oslo and in November of that year they were married. Kind of they were already proxy married but whatever. Now that whole not making it to Scotland thing and her ship uniquely being plagued by these contrary winds wasn't going to fly and finding who's responsible became the order of the day. Eventually, the Danish Minister of Finance and the Danish Admiral, the head of the 20-ship armada, blamed each other. And of course, neither wanted to accept responsibility and inspired by the enormous witch process ongoing in Trier over in Germany, they did what any good government bureaucrat does, blame a third party, namely, witches did it. The finance minister, already having a whole set of political problems, sought to the mayor of Copenhagen to question Anna Coldings, an accused witch who was actually accused for completely other things besides this contrary winds business, and already herself a kind of celebrity being held in prison, and they tortured her, and under torture, Coldings admitted to being part of a coven of witches, including the very person the finance minister wished to blame for the whole ship business. Unsurprisingly, when you torture people looking for an answer, you will probably find it. That had sent a team of, I guess, I guess, Navy SEAL demons up to the keels of the ship in order to scuttle it. Coldings and 12 other women would eventually be executed for witchcraft, leading to a further chain reaction, eventually leading 17 more women to their doom throughout the course of that year, because the Admiral and the Finance Minister didn't want to take responsibility for badly outfitting a ship. Now with the Danish Navy SEAL demons dispatched, they attempted to return home and the king and the queen were all now beset by contrary winds again and unfavorable weather and James, I suppose reasonably as much as anything is reasonable at this time, wondered if a similar satanic plot had also been hatched against him in his native Scotland given the unfolding Copenhagen witch process. Not just the, you know, the sea in the north is unstable. Of course, if anyone in 1590 goes looking for witchcraft, especially a monarch thinking that an international satanic conspiracy is targeting them, they will inevitably find it through torture, thus setting off another chain reaction dooming further women, this time in Scotland. This extraordinarily complex series of trials known to history as the North Berwick Trials was set off when Gillis Duncan, a servant, developed miraculous healing powers and was setting off every other night. 
Her employer, curious about what these goings-on were, her skipping out of work every other night, did what any employer would do in the late 16th century. He tortured her with thumbscrews, a pretty clear violation of Scottish law and basic human rights, and eventually by pricking. This is a process by which a large needle was inserted into the skin and various parts of the body in search of a numb part. You can imagine all those cases where they poked a big needle into you that wasn't numb how wonderful that was. That numb part was taken to be part of the devil, and learning, of course, to an eventual confession that she was also part of a coven of witches, including most famously a local folk healer, Agnes Sampson, a local schoolmaster and alleged leader of this coven, John Fian, Barbara Napier, and eventually even James's hated rival, Francis Stewart, the fifth Earl of Bothwell, who James hated and was, would have loved to have seen executed. The emergent narrative, published as News from Scotland in 1591, detailed how this coven met in a church on Halloween. Yep, on Halloween. Presided over by the devil himself, the ceremony of the infamous Osculum Infame, whereby the satanic adherents kissed the anus of Satan. Various bewitchments and possessions inflicted on the townspeople, and of course, the plot to kill James VI at sea. That plot, by the way, on at least the Scottish side of things, involved taking a cat, christening it, making it basically magically linked with James VI, and then drowning that poor cat in the sea. Of course, this entire story, really several dozen contradictory stories because they were all tortured, involved hundreds of alleged witches, far too many to have ever fit inside that little church by the sea, was derived at some of the most horrifying torture imaginable that I will not describe here, which was, by the way, patently illegal in both England and Scotland at the time. Now, James was personally involved in the trials, attending some of the torture interrogations. Agnes Sampson even has said to have whispered things in his ear that only James and his wife spoke about while they were in their time at Oslo. It's kind of weird. But that had the effect of wholly convincing James to the reality of the international satanic plot. In the end, over a hundred people would be accused of witchcraft, dozens would be horrifically maimed and traumatized through torture, and at least as many were executed through strangulation, their bodies being publicly burned. Oh yeah, that being strangled before you were burned, that's constitutive of mercy. Now, James VI was always pretty studiously religious, and the trials of the 1590s no doubt led him to a much further belief in the reality and pervasiveness in Europe of witchcraft, but also to lament that the current laws on the books didn't go far enough to deracinate this practice, which to his mind and the mind of many jurists and theologians threatened all of Christendom, but to further worry about the emergent intellectual trend that doubted what we now call the elaborated theory of witchcraft. Both continental texts like Johann Weyer, the student of Cornelius Agrippa of Three Books of Occult Philosophy fame, his 1563 Des Prestigis Demonum et Incantantibus Advini Ificiis on the illusions and the, of the demons and of the spells on poisons, and even more recent texts like the Insular 1584 volume The Discovery of Witchcraft by Reginald Scott drew out a range of arguments from witchcraft just being parlor tricks to early in conceptions of things like mental illness. And you know that most of the information was derived from torture to explain this witch narrative, or as James might have it, to explain them away. Now, James, no doubt informed by all of this, would go on to compose in his own discourse on the reality, nature, and Christian need to prosecute witchcraft and deem necromancy in his 1597 Demonology. The Demonology is a relatively brief tract of about three chapter-length books in dialogue form, actually chosen by James as a form of early edutainment given its popularity at the time. The conversation about witchcraft is had by two characters, Philomathes, more of a witchcraft skeptic, and Epistemon, clearly the avatar of James himself. The text is actually a very interesting study in the fault lines of Catholic and Protestant demonology. For instance, James is clearly relying on continental 
Catholic text for a great deal of the subject matter covered, but also deeply disdains any connection to Catholicism or papistry, as he would have it, covering the more highly developed conceptions in a veneer of, well, pure scripture, a la Protestantism. It's as if he's discovered the elaborated theory of witchcraft using a sola scriptura method, but in reality, he's just kind of papering over his reliance on Catholic sources like the Malleus Maleficarum. The first book expresses the doubt of Philomathes about the reality of recent tales of witchcraft, which are met with Epistemon's assurance of its reality, mostly with appeals, again, to scripture. All forms of magic and divination, from ceremonial necromancy, folk magic, and judicial astrology, are condemned as in league with the devil, whether the people doing them are doing them knowingly or not. Even studying such matters is perilous, given that the devil is the ultimate author of all of those kinds of fields. Of particular interest in Book 1, and the Scottish flavor, the particularly Scottish flavor of the elaborated theory of witchcraft, is the pact with the devil in which one signs in blood to surrender one's soul for a demonic boon. For James, the pact is simply a manner by which one short-circuits the dangers of interacting with fallen angels. Like, if you mess it up, they'll kill you. And this is any kind of fallen angel or spirit from ghosts to fairies to elemental creatures, even helpful brownies, who are the cutest of spirits, are for James really just evil fallen angels in various forms. This is done by obtaining such powers directly from the devil himself. Regardless, all such purveyors of magic should be equally persecuted, including court conjurers. These last lines in chapter 1 are probably a dig at Queen Elizabeth keeping Dr. John Dee long rumored and rightly so to be a magus in her trust at court. Dee would actually live into the early years of James the first rule and personally asked to be tried for sorcery to try to prove his innocence. Thankfully, this never happened, allowing Dee to die naturally around 1608 or 1609. His communications with angels were not publicly known until he was safely dead. The second book raises further objections, including the idea that at least some witches are actually suffering from melancholia, what we would now call mental illness. James rejects this and says that the symptoms are nothing like melancholia along with detailed descriptions about the difference between witchcraft and necromancy. Here, James reasons that the devil tempts people to such dark arts because they lie in powerless or poverty or both. Playing into their desire for money or sex or power, the devil traps them into his service and provides them with power by proxy, which ultimately damns them. Here, the witch's Sabbath is detailed using details actually from his experience of the 1590 trial, including the idea that the Sabbath take place in a church and not the more usual bucolic setting, and the important detail about the osculum infame, the kissing the devil's anus. And here, if they can travel by air or become small animals to attend the Sabbath. Interestingly enough, James actually differs from many other insular sources here with his focus on the witch's flight, which was much more agreed upon in continental sources than in insular sources. It was actually doubted in most of Britain. Further discussions follow about why women are more likely to become witches. I mean, this is the classically misogynistic, weaker sex argument that is actually made famous by the Malleus Maleficarum. James then details the various means by which Satan empowers witches to do his bidding, including the use of wax evigies for magical torment, though he doesn't mention christened cats, various demonically enchanted poisons, magics which cause strife and love and envy, the spreading of various kinds of diseases, the induction of insanity causing possessions and hauntings, and the most feared magic of all in the Middle Ages, weather magic, like using hail to cause crop failure, or, he mentions, using a tempest to sink a ship. Like, he's still kind of pissed about that, y'all. Such evil should empower a magistrate to bring the utmost punishment upon such witches, unafraid of their power and thus, at least in some sense, protected by God. Of course, James never, never foregoes an attack on papistry, blaming their stupidity and superstition, on why it appears that there were more ghosts and spirits in the past than now, 
and as a punishment upon them, that is to say why there's more witchcraft now than there used to be in the past. The third and final book details the various kinds of spirits by which the devil affects his will upon the earth via witchcraft. These are haunting spirits, vexing spirits, possessing spirits, and various kinds of spirits typically known as fairies, at least in the insular setting. For James, however, all of these spirits are just guises taken by fallen angels to destroy the faithful and punish the wicked. In fact, he denounces all the various titles and names of demonic spirits popular in grimoires at the time as basically nonsense. He kind of picks this point up from Johann Weyer. Given that they lost such titles and ranks and even their names when they fell in sinful rebellion against God. Of particular interest to James, however, and many writers of the time, because everyone's obsessed with sex, were the succubi and the incubi who were said to copulate with humankind, though using the stolen and sterile semen of the dead. Yes, dead people's semen. Further discussions are given to what we would now call night terrors, actually, the mayor, which James reasons actually aren't demons, just so you know, but a naturally built up amount of oppressive phlegm over the heart, weighing one down and paralyzing one's movement. It's an interesting depiction of night terrors. Of course, another dig at the papists is always in order such that their exorcisms, Catholic exorcisms, only work temporarily, and even when they only work, they work because of the power of God and not because of Catholic superstitions. Finally, we're told that fairies, otherwise popular insular spirits, including the helpful brownies, are themselves just either demons or tall tales. The last sections are perhaps the most practically impactful of the entire text and in many ways are the most revealing. Given all of what James has discussed, he urges much stricter laws and prosecutions of the witches and of witchcraft. Here James is at his most reactionary. He urges prosecutions for even the very young, only exempting the youngest children, with the punishment being immediate and inevitable execution. Detection of a suspected witch should proceed through torture, especially pricking the body for the devil's mark, the acceptance of even spurious testimony, spectral attendance of Sabbaths, even the use of witch swimming. This is dunking women in water to see if they're a witch, a practice that was actually been con officially condemned since the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, which ended, by the way, clergy from engaging in any kind of trial by ordeal, is encouraged in this text. And in a sense, James would get his way. The ensuring years of the witch trials in Scotland would be some of the most severe of the period of all of Europe, only really outmatched by the nightmare that were the German trials. Why? Why was Scotland so bad? While Scotland was centrally organized, unlike Germany, many witch trials happened at the local level, with local magistrates happening with very little legal training or administrative oversight. At this local level, conviction and thus execution rates were nearly twice the rates of better trained circuit and high courts. Now, this is a trend seen all over Europe, but unlike in France, for instance, where a centralized government typically would push capital cases to Paris and thus to higher courts and even with the possibility of appellate courts, Scotland failed in this respect almost completely despite recognizing how things actually went off the rails in the trials of the 1590s. Further, while interrogational torture was illegal in both England and Scotland, unlike on the continent, the crime of witchcraft came to be seen increasingly as tantamount to treason and thus allowed for the relaxation of this stricture. Scotland was especially brutal in its deploy of torture, especially the use of sleep deprivation as a form of torture, which invariably would produce vivid hallucinations in addition, while Scotland and England used a jury system, unlike the inquisitional system on the continent that just had judges decide guilt and innocence, the Scottish jury only needed a majority vote for a conviction, unlike the unanimous vote needed down in England. Of course, the trials of the early 1590s made famous because of James's involvement and the further direct involvement of the Calvinist clergy eager to establish themselves as legitimate into all of this made that the skepticism about the elaborated theory of witchcraft come very late to Scotland. The trials were more intense, more vicious, 
longer chain reactions and skepticism came very late. All of this had the combined impact of making for a much more brutal period of witch hunting compared to, say, England. In fact, many of these conditions would also be present in the American colonies, thus resulting in trials which much more mirrored Scotland, though much less in the way of torture, rather than England over in the colonies. In New England, for instance, a mere population of 100,000 souls produced 234 indictments and 36 executions, with more than half of those numbers accounted for in the Salem trials of 1692. If you do the math there, that is an enormous level of convictions versus population and executions versus population. In many ways, the colonial American trials may have been even more vicious than the Scottish trials. Of course, James VI of Scotland would become James I of England and Ireland in 1603. That same year would see an immediate reprint of his demonology along with the grim tale of the 1590 trials and news from Scotland. That following year, he would pass the Witchcraft Act of 1604, which updated the relatively lenient Elizabethan Witchcraft Act of 1563. For instance, whereas the 1563 Act of Elizabeth had only a year of prison for the first offense of, I don't know, felonious necromancy, James's Act, as you imagine, immediately called for execution by hanging. While one expects a significant increase in witchcraft executions following the new Act, that actually doesn't seem to be the case. There isn't a large population-wide increase in the amount of prosecutions. However, it was under this act that Matthew Hopkins, the self-styled witch finder general, operated as was responsible for about a hundred different hangings in the three-year period from 1644 to 1647. Three years, making him and his associates among the most lethal witch hunters in European history, at least in terms of time versus killing. By comparison, the writer of the infamous Malleus Maleficarum, the most important text of witch hunting, Henricus Antisitor, could only claim about a hundred indictments, only about half as many executions in his entire career as a witch hunter. Kramer could claim 50 in his entire career, Hopkins kid that number in three years. Regardless, a version of that statue would remain on the books until the reversal of the Witchcraft Act of 1735, and this would eventually be replaced by the Fraudulent Mediums Act of 1951, which was itself repealed on the 26th of May 2008. The trials of the 1590s would go on to influence images of witchcraft through the Anglophone world, deeply informing William Shakespeare's depiction of the witches in Macbeth. I mean, they literally mention using witchcraft to sink ships there in Macbeth. Only in the March of 2022, this year, would the government of Scotland officially apologize for the witch hunts that went on in the country through all those dark centuries. The North Berwick Trials, their publication and news from Scotland and King James's 1597 demonology remain some of the most important English language documents from the period of the trials and greatly helped to cement the elaborated theory of witchcraft into the Anglophone imaginary. In that way, they are important cultural reminders of a time when religious conspiracy theories and the violation of due process in the interest of a verdict foregone in the minds of the prosecutors masqueraded as doing the will of God, much less earthly justice. The best introduction to the trials and the text of this episode can be found in Lawrence Norman's really wonderful and comprehensive Witchcraft in Early Modern Scotland, James the Sixth Demonology and the North Berwick Witches. This edition is simply necessary reading for anyone interested in the history of witchcraft in the Anglophone world. Unfortunately, the edition by Donald Tyson is perhaps the most popular, at least among occulty folks, but the introduction and the notes rely on notoriously incorrect and out of date scholarship like Murray's Witch Cult in Western Europe and should all be treated with a healthy dose of skepticism. Of course, again, you gotta check out Anton Shea's adaption of the demonology. It's amazing in the original pronunciation. And make sure to check out my playlist on the early modern witch trials for more content on this topic and reading lists on the hunts.
Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.